guess this is the ransom. It is. Yeah. I hope. There's only three dates you need to remember. <laughs> Regarding the general conference. Let me see your marker. Be sure it's erasable. But thank you. Bow color dry erase. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Those, yeah. otherwise those three important dates may be there for. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there forever. That's, we're uh, kind of like Job. Job being. I'm thankful to be here today. I'm, I'm not <coughs> well lately, but I'm well enough to be above ground. <laughs> and, uh, and, up and through my 80s, I could do anything I wanted to do. And uh, now that I'm 91, I can't do quite as much as I did. I was re I remodeled a seven or six bedroom house in my, in my 80s. I was hanging sheetrock on my 85th birthday. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I finished that, thank goodness. But, as most of you know, I'm Terry Farrell. And, I, I guess my claim to fame here is that I was a delegate from California to the General Conference meeting in Oregon in August of 1940, and that's 73 years ago. Mm. I don't know of anybody else. There may be somebody here that's been a delegate longer than that, but <laughs> I don't know that there is. I've also been in the pastoral ministry for 72 years, and started June 8 of 1941 at uh, Hickory Grove, Iowa. I was uh, dating Barbara Fish at the time, and she was a, a student at the, the winter training school, and uh, so I had to be there at that time. But one of the things that was very interesting, and I, I tried to find the statistics on it, was at that time, every person had his own vote at conference. In other words, they had delegates, but every person attended and had his own vote. And then if the the, delegate, the people in that particular area couldn't be there, they turned their vote over to their delegate. The best I can remember, I had 380 votes. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was interested in my votes. I, I was courted quite a few times on different votes. To give you an idea, uh, my wife, my future wife, Orpha Lemagerier, was elected treasurer at that meeting and she received 1,394 votes against 657 for Leota Hansen. So that, you see, there were well over 2,000 votes represented there, <laughs> and, which was, was interesting. And, and the conference lasted for 10 days, too, in my day. 10 yes. hot days. Yes. 10 <laughs> hot days in Oregon. Yeah. And the church one air conditioned and, no. and it was sort of sticky. That was one thing about Oregon, Illinois. It was beautiful spring and fall and summer. It was blazingly hot and humid in the winter. The wind howled down the Rock River Valley. It was really bad. Gary, I want to know if it was your 300 volt block that won Orpha's heart. <laughs> so it was your 300 volt block that won Orpha's heart why she decided to take you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know I voted for her. <laughs> he, he was very young. Yeah. And he was very young and handsome. We had, uh, we had just finished uh, the uh, six weeks summer school, and Ellie Connor and S. J. Lindsay and Otto E. Dick were the instructors, and uh, it was I, I had been in Sunday school and church all my life, but there was something about six weeks of daily study morning to night, it just gels everything that you've learned before. And it was wonderful. In fact, before the six weeks was over, Sid McGaugh had us writing articles for the Restitution Herald. And so it, it was a wonderful time. But, uh, one of the things that I have noted in my paper is the ages of some of these people. So in other words, I, uh, the people who were there at that time, like Ellie Connor, he was born in 1862. So here we were in a close relationship with a man born during the war between the states. And uh, S.J. Lindsay was, was born in 1866, and Otto Dick was born in 1901. So they were all uh, take us way back. 
in fact, when I, uh, as far as I was concerned, that period of our history was kind of a golden age because the old timers were still around. We could talk to them. Uh, I remember I told the story. In fact, I told it to Jet Stilson about A.L. Carberry from Washington. He was born in 1862 also, and uh, he and Emma Railsback, who was born in 1870 get together and quote scripture. In fact, they claim that they, between them they could quote the entire New Testament from memory. Mm -hmm. I believe it because they would just uh, they would pick a book and one would quote several chapters and the other would pick up where they left off. They quit and the other would pick it up. So it was really, a, really amazing to hear. And uh, also uh, I also remember T. A. Drinker being there, he was born in 1888. He could also quote scripture, and he, at that time, he was that period of Church of God history when they did, did a lot of debating, and he would snow his opponents under by quoting so much scripture that they couldn't answer <laughs> all the scriptures that he quoted. So he'd win the debates. Uh, he had the volume also. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, you didn't sleep. Did not need a PA system when <laughs> Jay Drinker was around. We, if, if, I, if we were young and we sat in the back seat and somebody looked like they were going to drowse a little bit, he'd say, wake up back there. Yeah. He would point at us and then we'd want to ride on the, ride on the bench. I remember in the meetings of Holbrook, Nebraska, in the Burlington main line, Chicago to Denver, went through Holbrook about a half a block from the church and the Denver Zephyr went by at five after nine every night and during meetings and he was still preaching at five after nine. Everybody else had quit because they, everybody knew what time it was. Everybody, all the other preachers had quit but not T.A. He just took a deep breath and the Denver Zephyr went through and kept on preaching. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was a very good man. But Edna Brewer who was born in 1885, was also a wonderful person to commit scripture to memory. And uh, at the Bible student home on South Third, we would uh, memorize scripture at the table. And we could uh, quote quite a few chapters, just stand there and quote. Like, uh, Colossians 3, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, for Christ is from the right hand of God, set your affection on things above. Not on things on the earth. You are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And Christ, who is our life, shall appear, and shall he also appear with him in glory. See, that's one of the, one of the texts we, we remember. We memorize and there were others too. But, uh, Kids don't do that nowadays, nor do we, because I don't. But the grandkids, you know, they get out their iPads or iPods and yeah. it all pops up. So memorization is, yeah. is gone. Right. And they learn how to locate it too. You know, yeah. lots, lots of jump up and locate, but it doesn't happen. We've got a lot of quizzers who are memorizing several chapters of Matthew right. and participating yeah. in the summer. Right. So that's, and they are memorizing? They're memorizing. Oh, yeah, they, are. They, are. Yeah, they still have their quizzes. Well, they, they have to. The golden right. age of memory is junior years. Yeah. Our pastor, Chris Siders, is a real, I mean, as long as Chris is around, there will be a quiz team, I think. <laughs> Because he's real. That that's his that's his big that's his big thing. He really likes to run it, like to do that quiz thing. Yeah, another person who was there was Judd Lyon in the back of uh, this presentation. I have pictures of the first general conference officers, and he was one of the officers in 1921. And he was born in 1872. He was Melvin Lyon's father. Eldred Marsh was there, and he was. He was born in 1881, and F.L. Austin was there, and he was born in 1870. And I always talk about F.L. Austin. He had lost his thumb some way. I think it was an ax. But anyway, he, he didn't have a thumb on his right hand. And if you, in his class, you happen to be sitting on the front row, you got pounded, and he'd walk up and hit you on the knee. So a lot of us learned after the first class, you don't sit on the front row. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> he was a very interesting man. He was one of the main teachers of the first Bible training school in the 20s and 30s. He couldn't remember something. He hit his head. And then he yes, he did. He hit, then his he hit his head. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Charles and uh, Mabel Nets were there. He was born in 75 and she was born in 1880. They were in Springfield, Ohio. I uh, had Charles' funeral in 1952 and the obituary that appeared in the Dayton paper was man dies like, the second time and he had died on the operating table early in his life and they revived him. He died in, in 1952. Anyway, after that, after he was you know, brought back, they asked him what death was like. He said, as far as I know, it's like the Bible said, the dead know not anything. And that was in his obituary in the day. But also, the, most of the members of the first Bible training school were still alive. Jerry Cooper uh, had had the TB. He was an amazing man. They physically removed one half of his chest. He just had, had one lung and one on one side of his rib cage. If he ever took his shirt off, you could see his heart in there beating. He was, he was an amazing person. He came down with TB at Eden Valley when he was living with Martha's mother. So they all had to have TB tests. But, uh, and he was from Ripley. What's that? He was from Ripley. Yes, he was. Yeah, he was, he was wonderful. Well, I had a privilege of, uh, in the Southwest Conference. Uh, the ministers got together several times a year. And Bill Dick was at Pomona. Jerry was at San Jose. Bernice Wolf was at Tempe. And we got together several times a year. We had wonderful Bible studies. No holes barred. And we just really thrashed it out. Okay. But, uh, Clarence Lapp, and the Crones, John Dentry, and Harvey Crew, Mary Sheets, and Melvin Lyon. And they were all still there. And Alfred Anthony, born in 1888, was there. William Whitehead, who was the sister of Daniel Wilson, who was born in 1881. Jesse Wilson was Benjamin's niece. And she was born in 1874. Evelyn Austin was born in 1880. And they were early Bereans and started the Berean Society. It was, uh, as far as particular movements or departments of what the departments of the General Conference now, the Bereans probably did more than anybody else to uh, unify the Church of God. Because they had a wonderful uh, correspondence and they put, published lessons and books got together in a moment. Okay, and another person, Alina Appleyard Ellis, who come over from uh, Waterloo, Iowa, and joined them. They were all very good friends. Uh, the Appleyards came from England with the Wilsons in the 1840s. So Alina Appleyard was Ellis was a member of the Appleyard family. Barbara's mother and father were there. She was born in 1883, and my wife's father was born in 1868. You can imagine that he was, he was the son of a Civil War veteran, and born in 1868. My wife was born in 1905, so you see she, she was my senior by 17 years. This was a, a wonderful time. Another man who was there that came up to be important was J.M. Morgan. He was born in 1868 also in Oklahoma. And I, I'm going to read off some of these names and they'll mean something to some of the older ones. But uh, in Indiana it was the Hattons and the Birches and the Pearsons and the Lighties. In Ohio came the Brewers, the Hopes, the Pearsons and the Macy's and the Smiths, the Dunbars, Valentines. Tomlinson's, Jones, Stadden's, Swartz's, and Demets. Michigan, it was the Munshaws, Slocum's, Niles, Dones, and Townsend's. I always remember Harley and Ruth uh, Townsend and their daughter Martha. Martha had childhood onset diabetes and died very young. I knew her when she was 18 or 20 years old. For those who don't know it, the Slocum's, that's Joyce that's Maps. Joyce Maps. Yeah, Joyce Maps. Yeah. She was surprised by the 
Minnesota, we had the Hoskins, the Mills, the Kirkpatrick's, the Randalls, the Johnsons, the Rosses and Maroons and Savages. One of the interesting families in the Church of God that I'd love to tell about was Roy and Ellsworth Johnson from Hector. And they had a common purse. They raised both their families under the same roof and had a common purse. And both families had a bunch of kids. It was, it was just wonderful to see because they you know, ran the same farm and went to the same church. And it was just harmony, Christian living. Uh, my, my daughter-in-law, you know, was, was, uh, was, was her mother was Grace, who was one of the Johnsons that lived yeah. on that farm. Yeah. But Grace did not like farming. She told Louise the worst thing she could do was to move down there on that farm and, and uh, I know she thought she was going to get Jay away, but there's no way that she's going to get Jay away from the farm. But Louise is very good. She's put up with it, but anyway, she came from there. She, her, her Grace, there's three of them in one bed. Three girls slept in one bed all day. And uh, so they look forward to the time they, they have their own bed. Yeah. Grace was a member of the Summer Bible Training School in 1940 also. Uh -huh. and, uh, first, we mentioned the Rooms and Rosses. Scott's family. Missouri, there were the Grahams and the Fifes, and Nebraska, there were the Phelpses, the Probes, the Carnets, and the Applebee's. Canada sent the Fletchers to Colorado, and A.B. Wilson at that time was living in Colorado. He was Joyce McCall's grandfather. Of course, Illinois had the most there. And there were the Madisons, the Lindsays, the McGaws, Hansons, the Harnett. Hardesty's, the Watkins, Mercer's, Paul Johnson, Geeson's, Nedros, Reed's, Andrews, Siples, Clausen's, Doden's, Ford's, and the Railton's, the Lanning's, the Canodles, the Carpenters, the Leaf Lighters, Burnett's, Caspers, and Moguls. And of course, Kentucky sent the Carpenters. Anybody on those that you want to talk about? They were wonderful. Um, Lee and, uh, this is Nedro. She's one. She started the East, East Oregon, Oregon she chapter. Started yes. East Oregon Church. Yes, she did. She, uh, she uh, was in this service station, and these little urchins came in, and she started a Sunday school for them. Yeah, no one knows about that. Yeah. Lee Dozen was a daughter of George Scheifel. She was a lovely woman. She taught singing. Who was singing. the Sam? Yeah, Who was the daughter of the Scheifels? Lee Doden. Okay. She was the daughter of uh, George. George. Yes, George and Cora Now was that Jean Downs? <coughs> Jean Downs, was she a disciple? No. No. Who was that? Jean Downs. Jean Downs was a Lindsay. She was a Lindsay. Yeah, she was a Lindsay. Lindsay. Yeah, she was Harold Downs' wife. Mm -hmm. Wasn't she related yeah. to the disciples? No, she was the daughter. Yes, yeah. yes because uh, her mother was a sister of Cora. Cycle, yes, she? something, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're yeah. sisters. Well, but she was, I'm sorry. Then James started out as a Lindsay. Because okay. she, she was Ward Lindsay's daughter. Yes, yes. Jim Madison goes back to the Lindsay's. Right. Yes, he does. Yeah. And uh, Mary Melanie uh, to the Austins. Yes, yeah. so. right. Yeah, And the Wilsons lived in the Happy Woods area, actually. Is it Benjamin Wilson that started a Bible class down there, which has resulted in that? Yeah, it's W.H. Wilson. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, he wrote several books. Yeah. Who who did the Pinewood Bible was class? He did. That was him. Yeah. yeah, I've got one of their books. Yeah, he yeah. did yeah. Dusty in Russia and Sign of the Times, yeah. and, and uh, he did uh, Bible Students textbook. Yeah. Who did the dialogue? That, that was Benjamin. 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 Okay. It's interesting that so many of these families are still represented. So, so many of these families are still represented. Yeah, that, 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 that's the amazing thing. Uh, you know, some of those you mentioned are still active in the church there no more. Yeah. Yeah, I think Sometimes it's through marriage, you know, their names have changed, but it's still that lineage. Yeah, that's yeah, I think that's wonderful. I, yeah. I, uh, yes, while we're talking about Benjamin, I, this is not in the first edition dialogue. I'm sorry. It's in, in pretty rough condition. 
but uh, this is what the diagram looked like in that time. And this one is signed R.A. Curtis, that was Rufus Curtis, mm. who was a member of the Fresh Creek Church. And C.E. Lapp inherited it in 39, and then he one time put his books out on the table that he didn't want to keep. And so I picked it up. And this is a preface to the first Jehovah's Witness uh, publication. They, uh, uh, a friend of the uh, Watchtower, uh, bought the plates uh, from uh, Fowler and Wells in 1904. And uh, anyway, he, he says that it's a, a valuable translation, but he said it was imperfect. He said uh, he had his fault. He was seen that the author must had the view that Jesus had no pre-human existence, <laughs> and there was no personal devil, and, that, uh, and also that Jesus is still a man in, in flesh and glory. Of course, the Jehovah's Witness believe that his body was assumed way into gases, so they, they don't believe that he's mm -hmm. in heaven. But that was the editor of the, the Zion's Watchtower that wrote that in the first Jehovah's Witness edition. You know what date that was, the uh, the Bible, what date it was printed? This one? Uh-huh. Uh, this was done by Wells uh -huh. in Chicago. This was dated 1880. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm glad to have it even if it is in rough shape. <laughs> yeah. And while we're talking about people, this is God's Plan of Salvation by J.M. Stevenson. And he has Ripley connections too. And this one belonged to Morris Choblin, mm. uh, who was a very early Church of God man, uh, editor of the Restitution. It was given to him by Alfred Jones. He was also from, from Cleveland. And uh, Ruth Tomlinson gave it to me. Mm. But uh, it's a very It's good. amazing to go into the Ripley Cemetery. You know that Ripley at the turn of the century. Yeah. was one of the biggest manufacturers of pottery next to Ohio. They had a contest. And there's some bit. of the stones out there that were made by the potters themselves. And there's one there that's beautiful. It's white clay with blue inscription. And it says, now what's this sound like to you? Waiting the restitution of our Lord. Uh -huh. And for people that are not Church of God, they read that and say, well, what is this all about? Yeah. That's wonderful, right? <clears throat> Yes, it's that's beautiful. It's getting Ripley pottery, but yeah. I collect Edgefield, South Carolina pottery okay. and have one of the largest collections in existence. I have over 100 pieces wow. and uh, give you an idea of some made by a slave by the name of Dave. He put his own name and the date on it and they start at $50,000 and go up. And wow. if he wrote verses on some of them and they started at 150000 and go up. I have um, pieces that are well worth well over a hundred thousand dollars. So, what kind of verses did he put on scriptures? Wow. Some of them were scripture. I made this jar all of cross. If you don't repent, you will be lost. <laughs> sure, that, sure, this jar will hold lard and fresh meat. Bless me, were when Peter saw the folded sheet. <laughs> those are some of them. Those, they started at one hundred fifty thousand dollars. I won't. Own, I'll never own one. I have had one offered to me very early on. When I first started collecting, they wanted five thousand dollars. They just well said a million at that time. Yeah. It said, "Sure, this jar will hold twenty. Fill it with silver, and you will have plenty." <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't inherit that one. This is the coming age by Weathy, and uh, in the restitution, uh, they advertise this book. And one of the reasons that I'm uh, mentioning it to you is that uh, he believed that the Arabs were the fourth empire in the image. And I have come to believe that myself. That, uh, it's not Rome, but it's the Arabs. And uh, in fact, I, I wondered for the long time uh, how there could be an enemy in the age, end of the age during the tribulation, that the Jews would be the enemies and the church would also be the enemies. Well, Islam is the answer to that. We're, we're all unbelievers. This book by Weekly is still available. I bought that 
got it through Adolf is called the Eastern Question. And it's interesting to me that they, they would keep that. It's one of these print-on-demand books. You order it, and they print it. <laughs> you. You, know, you know, Terry, you have this thing in here about Ellie Connor. And, you know, his wife, you know, was not a Church of God member. She was, what, a member of a Christian church, wasn't it? I think so. And when, and when he died, why, she had Sid McGaw, and she had the Christian minister for the funeral. Uh -huh. And Jim Madison was there. And, uh, you know, just, you know, I think he was 18 or 20. I know what we were young. He, I was in Oregon, and he had just come back. And he said, well, he said, uh, the Christian minister spoke first. So he said, he preached Brother Connor to heaven. And then he said, Sid McGaw brought him back. <laughs> <laughs> I was privileged when I lived in Los Angeles to have access to a bookstore called Acres of Books in Long Beach. And they had said they had over 500,000 volumes. And I found many Church of God books mm. and many other books that were very valuable. This one is The Doctrine of a Future Life by Alger. And the thing that's valuable about it Back in the appendix, he lists all of the works having to do with the doctrine of the future life. Church of God is in here many times. Mm. You can go through this and it lists all of the books. It uh, lists the debate that H.B. Reed had with, uh, at that time, that debate, and lists all of those. And most, it tells where the books are, and there's an H after most of them, that's Harvard. Mm. And I got on the Harvard Library, well, Alvin makes mention of this book. In, his systematic theology, but it's a, it's a wonderful book. The, uh, I've collected a lot of the ephemera. These are prospectuses of the Illinois Bible School in, at Oregon, and so it shows people, and my Aunt Lita Railsback McLeod is in almost all of them, uh, because they were they went up to Ganymede Springs up the river, and it shows, shows all the different, different people. And I have also collected a lot of photographs, and I've identified quite a few, but this one I did not. I have mylar that I put over it and put them down, but this is the uh, Illinois Conference in 1913 at the Old Oregon Church, which at that time, uh, it had belonged to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church had built it, and this is before they uh, put the big addition on the front of it. Of course, now they have a new, completely new church. And uh, this one is Michigan Conference in 1907. And uh, I have identified quite, a, identified quite a few of the people. I, I said I did this Mylar overlay and uh, went down through here. But one of, the, one of them was interesting was O.R.L. Crozier and his wife in there. And they're, they're very prominent in the, the history. But uh, it's interesting to see these people and, and um, be able to identify some of them. This is a publication that I put out for the National Brain Youth Conference in 1960 at Dixon. And one thing I did at that time, I did leave uh, good footprints. I told where I got all the information so that anybody coming after could say, well, that was in. That was in restitution, five fifty-seven, number fifteen, or something like that. So <laughs> that they could uh, look it up. So, uh, uh, Janet, uh, I think, gave me too much credit. She 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 mentioned me over and over, but I I am in that uh, a good many times. But I do want to talk just in closing. Uh, we we were shortened on our time, but Ellie Connor. Uh, we got to know very well, and I admired him very much. And we would, he taught a, a mediocre church history by Hurlbut, and he also taught orthoepy. I never had heard of orthoepy, and I don't, most people haven't, but it's reading with uh, inflection, is what it amounts to. Anyway, we, we would get him off of the lesson, and he would tell about his life and his experiences. And I felt that that was much more important than the courses he was teaching. I, I related to Janet you know, three stories. One of them was when he was in law school, he was not a member of our church, and they, they were going to have a debate 
on the, the man possessing the immortal soul. And he thought, well, surely man does, and so he he took the affirmative on the in the debate, and so he said, well, the best place to learn is the Bible. So he read the New Testament through and didn't see it. He said, I must have missed it, and he went back and read it again. It wasn't in there, so he said, man doesn't have any immortal souls. <laughs> he became a conditional immortality man. Mm -hmm. and another one that he, that he told was about how they were so poor, and uh, the folks would go, they would go to town and they would buy an orange. They would give the kids the peeling, and the folks would eat the orange. When he got his first money, he went to town, he bought an orange, ate the peeling, and threw the orange away. <laughs> 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 and another one, they, they rented the Cleveland church to the Jews, and they would turn all their pictures to the wall. Mm -hmm. So when they come in on Sunday, all the pictures would be turned to the wall. <laughs> the one that I did not tell her, I thought it was very interesting. It was about a horse named Charlie. And uh, Charlie was splay legged. His legs went off the side. He just couldn't work well. So all his life he was traded around, maybe for a pocket knife or a bushel of apples or whatever anybody wanted to give. One day the local horse trader came by and said he wanted to buy Charlie and offered him five dollars. And he said, Where is he? And Connor pointed to his pasture and he went down came back and he said, Charlie's dead. Why didn't you tell me? He said, well, you didn't ask. <laughs> Everybody knew old Charlie, so anyway, he sold him a dead horse. <laughs> but the lesson is that you always have to tell the truth but you don't have to tell everything you know. <laughs> and I think that is a <coughs> lesson. I've used that at times in my life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if somebody is very ill or something like that and somebody asks about it, I just, I wouldn't tell them the whole story. I wouldn't tell them, well, everybody else has had that died. I wouldn't tell them something more. I thought that was a good uh, lesson. He was the general manager of the National Bible Institution uh, during the 30s, and uh, they were dying in bankruptcy, and uh, he called in all the notes and, and uh, wrote them all off on the cents on the dollar and saved it the National Bible Institution or the General Conference. Otherwise, it might have died uh, in the Depression. The, uh, the conferences, uh, our people were very used to conferences, and uh, from the time many of them went through the Millerite movement. They were not maybe not members of the Millerite movement, but they, uh, they just went through it and they had a lot of conferences. So there were a lot of conferences in the prior before that. A.J. Eichner, who was born in 1846, noted in his diary that he met J.M. Stevenson, T.J. Newman, H.B. Reed, Benjamin Wilson, and S.J. Jacobs at a conference at Cranes Grove in September of 1862. In the Michigan Conference in 1858, they appointed O.R.L. Crozier to attend other conferences. And uh, so anyway, they, they were, there were a lot of conferences held in 69 and 70, but no general conference. The first general conference was held in 1888. I said there were only three dates, if you remember. This is sad to me to think that that general conference was called by George F. Work of the Philadelphia Church of God and the Brooklyn, the New York Church of God. Well, there are no churches there anymore. But we all know that the church is people. And if you don't have people, you don't have a church. So when the Western migration came, those people all moved west. So uh, Alva found that when he was at, uh, in Virginia that he was related to about half of his congregation because they had moved from Virginia to the Midwest. When I was in Nebraska, almost everybody in the Holbrook Church was from Indiana. And they had, uh, when land became available in Nebraska, they moved out there to Homestead. So uh, our people have done that, and of course we moved all the way west. My people uh, were Southerners and moved west during Reconstruction. So that's how I have to be born in California. But uh, it was it was very active. It was a very active conference. They published Bible lessons. They published uh, they published a quarterly, and it existed for several years. And she taught the system of education. And they, they attempted to establish a Bible college, 
but they decided it was a little too young. And uh, one thing that all of the Church of God General Conference people started, they did not want a creed. That one, that one of the things that they just said, we're not going to accept a creed. One thing that most of the churches have creeds, and uh, one thing that they did not want one. I, I have theorized that, the, that having a creed was saying that our doctrines have all been established. In other words, they're written in stone and they're not going to change. That's one thing about the Church of God is it has worked out different things through the years. One of the things that some of them come through the church would be Josephitism and uh, Sabbatarianism and Universalism. They've all gone through the, through the church and have been shown to be in scriptures so they've been uh, cast off. I have nothing about it. I know a lot of those people and I knew what they believed. And uh, I knew the Universalists and Josephite people and some Sabbatarians. We think that there are doctrines now that may be dying, and some may not be dead, but the Roman interpretation of Scripture. I remember my dad was so anti-Catholic that everything in their church was Roman Catholic, was the beast and the false prophet and everything else. <laughs> and today, the Roman Catholic Church is really undergoing some really tough times with sexual predators and all that kind of stuff. They're not the power that they were. And, uh, of course, Joseph uh, couldn't be the father of Jesus. As well. One of the things that I've heard you say in describing Church of God people is that we basically are hard-headed, stubborn. <laughs> I wrote that in the margin here, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Church of God Abrahamic faith people are rugged individualists. <laughs> That the reason we have fought through the years at different times over things is because we're such individualists and we have our strong feelings and we, we're just out to defend them. If anybody don't believe it, just come to Guthrie Grove. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My brother Lathar Crumson, our own Richard A. Lathar which we uh, stayed in contact with and hadn't seen him for a couple of years, but still email and stuff and been really dear friends. And they no longer in the Church of God, they're Lutherans now. But uh, he said to me that the Church of God, with his dad being a minister and everything, was always fearful to him because of the way they preached it, you know, and it had to be this way, and if you didn't do it, to the point as a child and even growing up, it was always scary. And I never right. ever thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah. That it, it just was so severe, he thought. And uh, we, they well, scared people away. My uncle, Norman McLeod, our church came through the Christadelphians, and uh, Uncle Norman used to say that the Church of God is a Christadelphian church with the bitter taken out. <laughs> and that's the way he expressed the Church of God. Of course, he married Lita Raisbeck, Raisbeck of the Church of God, and my second cousin, J. Edgar Abson, married Grace Steffa, who was also a Church of God, so Church of God didn't have faith. General Conference came in to the church kind of back door. But uh, I, I was always raised to connect with the Church of God. I think Ernest Wolf was Christian Delphian. Yes, right. Wasn't he? Yeah. And he's, uh, he's 91. Mm -hmm. He lives near us. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the Psalms mm -hmm. book that just came out mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And he is now working on the entire series for the True Seekers Quarterly. So, and he is not doing real well, but he he's struggling, but um, he still drives. And he says, I can drive a lot better than I can walk. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the things that impressed me about Brother Connor. He was about 80 years old. He's six feet tall, had a full head of white hair, Still had all of his teeth, and he still drove. And those were those impressed me at that time. <laughs> I'm 91. I don't have my hair. <laughs> I still have all my teeth, and I drive. <laughs> you have to remember that, that uh, the Christabel is where Anthony first landed, you know, and then 
well, no, it was not worldwide, but I mean, when he got away from the church, from the worldwide church, he got doctrine. Christadelphians was the first place where he. I had an in interesting church. experience one time. I was with David Crow out in uh, California visiting some of our church people were doing some conference and college work out there. And I almost saw David Crow drink a cup of coffee. <laughs> and, uh, Mildred Stanchel, yeah. uh, she was about to pour that stuff down his throat. <laughs> she was insistent that David have a cup of coffee. She was a rails back also. Yeah. You know, I was raised in Church of God. I said, I have all bases covered. I was sprinkled a Catholic, which I don't remember, of course. <laughs> <laughs> then went to uh, my whole family accepted Christ and was immersed in Southern <coughs> Baptist. I knew what I was doing, no doubt how I accepted Jesus Christ. And then came into the Church of God uh, before marrying Rob. So I have all bases covered, and I had never, ever felt, though, that the Church of God's doctrine, what they preach and teach is anything but the truth, nor is it scary at all. My, mo my mother was a Methodist, my father was a Baptist. Our car broke down one Sunday, we couldn't get to the Methodist church. And so, two, two blocks away was South Mountain Church, and we could walk there. And, uh, <laughs> and the next time, and all my friends were there. It wasn't like Wally, he said he felt strange. And But anyway, the next Sunday, I wanted to go there, so my, I was a uh, daddy's girls. My father went with me. My mother was stubborn and she kept on going where she went. But after six weeks, she said, We have to. Dad said, Well, this yeah. is where we're going. And uh, the, church of God, the Church of God answered all their mysteries. I mean, they said all the things they could never figure out why that they found it in the Church of God. I was surprised people I tell them if there's anything better come to Long I would go that way. Otherwise, the Church of God is the well, there's some people that are different. Well, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah.